breathing in and out. And then visualize in the space in front of you is Purashakyamuni in the form of a fully ordained monk. Gazing at you with great compassion and wisdom. Being inseparable from your Lama or your Lamas. And guiding you on the way the full awakening of the Buddha. And then think that the Buddha is surrounded by the masters of the Nalanda tradition, Nagarjuna. Ayadeva and so forth. And by all the other masters of the different Buddhist traditions, Tibetan tradition, Chinese tradition, and the others. Just get a sense of their presence in the space in front of you. And remember that they too are inseparable from your Lama, real Lamas. And as usual, we are also surrounded by all sentient beings seated all around us. And despite their different physical appearance or different personality, all of them similar in that, like us, want to be happy and be free from problems and unwanted experiences.
with everyone having the right to be free from suffering. Yet controlled by basic misapprehension of reality or misperception of reality. They're not able to find a way to overcome their problems, their difficulties. So let's generate. affectionate love towards each and every sentient being. Sense of care, affection, and concern for their well-being. feeling of closeness and love. It was all sentient beings. And then focusing on all the unwanted experiences of sentient beings, generate great compassion, wish for all sentient beings to be free from all suffering and its causes. Together with a wish, may I be able to help them to reach a state that is free from all suffering and its causes. which then gives way to the altruistic attitude that takes personal responsibility for the welfare of sentient beings. And is determined to do whatever is necessary to help sentient beings to reach a state of liberation. from suffering, from samsara. And since we can effectively only do so once we become a Buddha ourselves, become awakened ourselves. Let's generate the mind of enlightenment, the wish to become fully enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings.
And it's with that motivation that we also today go through the different questions. And complete this course. And that's first, without letting go of bodhicitta, uh, recite the prayers. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. Reverently I prostrate with my body, speech and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time. And rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence. and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of others to the great enlightenment. Okay. So I'll say a little bit about the next course, but I'll do that towards the end of the session. And let's first go through some of the questions that I didn't cover last time. Also, Jimmy sent some new ones. Thank you, Dalit, for forwarding um, them to me. Okay, so let me just go through and mark the questions that I find I haven't really addressed yet. Um, this is also part of one of Jimmy's question, and I don't think I've addressed it properly as part of his question on the emanation, like emanating bodies. Um, I'm using the word emanate here only in the Buddhist sense. So just to emphasize that again, when I use the word emanate to describe the word or to as a translation, as a as a term for the Tibetan word Dhruva, then as I said last time, it means a bodhisattva, for instance, can 
in a controlled fashion emanate different appearances that appear to sentient beings and benefit sentient beings um, by way of showing them the path, teaching them, being an example, and so forth. Now, his question is, is like emanating, does that mean like, well, for us, when we take on another body, do we emanate this body? And the answer is no, it's not like from the subtle energy winds that we actually manifest a body. Instead, our body connects to a, a, a physical um, support, if you like, a physical basis. In the case of a human being, the fertilized egg. And that connection is made. So it's not an emanation, although it is still that kind of body, that connection we have to it is due to our karma and our afflictions. Um, and so in connection or in, yeah, in relation to that, he asks also furthermore, as there's no autonomous independent controller behind our present single body. For example, a controller who lifts the arms, moves the legs, etc. Although it seems so, would it be the case? Would that be the case? Would that be the same for the bodhisattvas and Buddhas who emanate various bodies? I, I may have addressed it last time, but I don't feel I've said. Uh, I didn't talk about it in a in a way that I feel it was clear enough. Um, so there being no single, he continues. He continues saying there being no single independent controller behind them, just as in our own case. Yes, so that is the case, whether it's an ordinary sentient being or a Buddha, Bodhisattva. Um, it's different types of consciousness. I and mean, when we say the mind, it sounds like it's a single entity, but of course there's more than just one mind. Uh, there are the sense consciousnesses, but then mainly the mental consciousnesses that are responsible for well, in the case of a Bodhisattva or Buddha or an Arya Bodhisattva and Buddha manifesting or emanating different appearances. And in our case, well, being responsible for connecting to, let's say, a new body in the next life, that's mainly the, the mental consciousness. And there are different aspects of that. I mean, coarser minds, subtler minds, uh, on the subconscious level, there's definitely a lot happening uh, and so there's not an independent controller. It's just these different moments of mind, uh, different, uh, yeah, different moments. Can You can say like, because they change all the time. And sometimes it's different minds, a coarser mind, a subtler mind, and so forth. And in that way, it's not a single controller that the person, that person, or a, a person is just labeled on the basis of these different minds in this situation, well, in the case of an Arya Bodhisattva or a Buddha emanating different appearances, and for us, just continuing to create the causes for cyclic existence. So that's just one thing I, I thought I didn't address uh, or I didn't talk about um, in a clear enough way last time. Um, then... Oh, it's the same as still this question. What's the difference between a, a mental aspect and an appearance? I thought I kind of answered that last time. It comes up a lot in the questions uh, I, I received last week. And then this week, I think he again talks about it. <coughs> well, as I, as I already said that, I, according to my understanding, they have the same meaning. What is the appearance? Let's say you look at a table. <clears throat> what is the appearance of the table? What is the aspect of the table? It's the same thing. I mean, the conscious, the mind, your eye consciousness, for instance, takes on the aspect of the table. That is the same as saying the table appears to the mind. However, um, the question that then arises, well, why use different words if they mean the same thing? Which is not unusual, which is very uh, common in Buddhist and Buddhist philosophy. For instance, we talk about phenomena being impermanent. We use the term impermanent to describe a certain class of phenomena. Uh, part of those phenomena are sense objects. They're described impermanent. What does impermanent mean? The meaning of impermanent is that they change all the time. From moment to moment, 
they undergo change that may not be obvious to us, but still, I mean, just thinking of uh, of sense objects like a table, it's made of subtle atoms and they are constantly changing. It's made of molecules and they're changing. Therefore, we can say the table changes. And that characteristic of an impermanent phenomenon, well, is described by the word impermanent. And then you have words such as a functioning thing, a functioning thing, um, able to perform a function. What does it mean? A functioning thing is something that performs the function of giving rise to a result in that every impermanent phenomenon in that it changes moment by moment, it gives rise to a later moment, which is its result, but it gives rise not just to its later continuum, but also to other phenomena. It affects uh, the phenomena around us, the phenomena around us, every impermanent phenomenon uh, does that. So it performs that particular function. So that is that function is expressed by the term functioning thing. And although impermanent and functioning thing are equivalent, synonymous, still they describe a slightly different characteristic of impermanent phenomena. They change all the time. They give rise to their own cause, to their own results, uh, and so forth. So in that way, there are many different terms used to describe something that is impermanent, that has just a slightly different meaning. And understanding these terms helps us to get a better understanding of something that is not permanent. Now here, in the case of using words such as, or terms such as appearance or aspect, if I say they have the same meaning, well, why do you use these different words? Now, my understanding is that when you talk about appearance, that relates more to the mind. What happens to the object? It appears to the mind. So in relation to the mind, the appearance of the object um, is really saying that something happens between the object and the mind, in that it at least, at the very least, appears to the mind. So whatever is the main object of a mind, it always appears. So I, I stress the fact that main object or principal object of a mind, because it's the thing that a mind is mainly focused on, if you like. Of course, there can be other objects, implicit objects. There can be objects that merely appear and they're not apprehended. Uh, anyway, that's extensively explained when you study Lorik, when you study about the mind. But anyway, having said that, so the principal object always appears. So let's take one example. It's always easiest to understand this on the basis of an example. Your eye consciousness perceives a table. And the principal object in this case is the table. And the table appears to the mind. So in relation to the mind, it becomes clear something happens to the mind when it takes on its principal object, the table. And then when we say it, the mind takes on the aspect of the table, I mean, the aspect of the table, um, to me, that connotes, at least from the Tibetan word, it goes more, it's more in relation to the object itself, that an exact representation of the object is now taken on. Whereas appearance, like I said, the word appearance relates to the mind. The word aspect relates to the object. So what is it that appears? An aspect of the object, right? An aspect of the object, a representation, something that is close enough to the object. Because otherwise, if the object, if the mind were did not take on the aspect of the table, we couldn't know table. We couldn't understand table. So the table doesn't enter our mind, doesn't enter our brain. The table is still over there. And still we can know its shape, its color, at least the part of the table that does appear, or the part of the table that the mind can take an aspect on, that the, as the aspect of which it can take on. 
that part of the table can only be known because, well, in terms of the aspect, the aspect is close enough to the actual table. And it appears to the mind. That appearance, that aspect appears to the mind. So you have these two terms, therefore, take on the appearance, take on the aspect, the object appears. And yeah, they when we take them to mind, they, slight, they appear to the mind slightly differently and they give us a full understanding of what's actually happening when a particular mind takes on a particular object. So I hope I've explained this in a way um, that is more satisfactory than, well, last time. Okay, so that's forgot to that question the mirror analogy I went through that Varda did not send any other questions so I'm still here with the seven, the, the question from Varda it, but uh, Varda can you answer Geshema well we can also do it later if she wants some time to think about it I, I just got to the I will, okay. mm -hmm. I will write you Geshema okay great sounds good thank you thank you Okay. All right. Um, and then there were, it's, I'm just going through the, the uh, email I got. And then there's, I continue the way I've, I've gone through it last time. Now, then there's one question here that I haven't mentioned before. Is there a first Buddha? That's one question. Um, is there a first Buddha? Well, no, actually, as there's no beginning to anything, there's also not said to be a first Buddha. There's always an enlightened being that preceded the Buddha, which is a very difficult concept, this concept of beginningless, of phenomena being beginningless. Uh, but I've stressed that also uh, on, on, at other times, that this is not unique to Buddhism. I mean, any system, whether it's science or well, let's say Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and so forth. I mean, those systems who said, I create a God. Is there a beginning to God? Has God existed since beginning this time? Or was there a time when God didn't exist? Um, if there was a time when God didn't exist, what was before God existed? Nothing. Well, at least nothingness has existed since beginning this time, right? I mean, you can argue even before God, there was nothingness. So what created nothingness and so forth? Um, or if God has always existed, well, there you have it, beginningness. Or in science, well, we talk about the Big Bang, of course, as being the beginning of this, this universe. But what was before that? There must have been something physical because you can't have all the, I don't know, molecules, etc., that resulted from the Big Bang, you can't have those without there having been something physical before the Big Bang. You, Big Bang. you don't get something physical out of nothing. So what was before and what was before? And again, you end up with beginning this time, a phenomena existing since beginning this time. Anyway, without going into uh, more details on that. So therefore, there's always some point you you always end up well beginning this so if there's a first buddha it's very difficult you can't posit it logically doesn't make sense because whoever has been become enlightened became enlightened through the teachings of a buddha i mean there's no being that becomes enlightened without another uh another with help the help without taking refuge etc the teachings etc of a buddha which is why it doesn't make sense that there was a fast Buddha. And since it's been, since sentient beings have existed since beginning of this time, um, well, Buddhas have existed since beginning of this time. And that's not very satisfactory for us, but that's just because our mind lacks this ability of vastness. We, we like very clear limits, very clear borders, beginnings and ends. We're used to them. And if we don't find them somewhere, well, I mean, it, it, just the way we draw sounds and we draw phenomena, if there were these really clear lines, I mean, on the subatomic level, there are no clear lines. And still, 
in order for us to be able to think about them, to have a internal image of them, I mean, we we create these artificial lines and concreteness. We we need concreteness, and this is all has to, has all to do with our sense of reality of something being very concrete and substantial there. So our mind at this point lacks the flexibility to think of this vastness in terms of time, beginning, there's no beginning, no end. Yes, so, but, but the, the problem is not reality. The problem is our own mind that is at this point not flexible enough. Okay, so therefore there's not been a first Buddha. There's, there will be a first time that every sentient being has become a Buddha. Yes, but that's different. Um, here it says again, can you elaborate more on the mind taking up the aspect of its object? Well, as I said, taking on the aspect of its object is the same as saying the object appearing. Um, maybe one thing that I didn't mention earlier, when you say the mind takes on the aspect of its object, there's this active aspect of taking on the aspect, whereas appearing is a lot more passive. But that's just a matter of talking about it. In both cases, it's the mind, well, something appears to it and the mind enables the object to appear to it because it's clear, it's luminous. And therefore, it's like whether you express it in this active way or you express it in a more passive way, it doesn't matter. According to my understanding, it means the same thing. So. I wanted to just mention that. Oh, and here's the question. When our mind takes on our body as its object, does our mind take on the aspect of our body? I mean, well, literally it says when our mind takes our body as its object. Yeah, I should have read it this way. Does our mind take up the aspect of our body? No, take on the aspect of our body. So when our mind takes to mind or takes our body as its object, does it take on the aspect of our body? Yes. Is this what we mean by body in the nature of mind or illusory body? No, no, no. That is very different. That is very different. Um, the body is not in the nature of the mind just because we our body, our mind takes on the object, I mean, apprehends the object. That doesn't mean the body's in the nature of mind. Otherwise, everything would be in the nature of mind because everything can be taken to mind. Um, so therefore, it doesn't mean illusory body. Illusory body is a body that is explained in Tantra in the context of high Stoga Tantra, in fact. Um, I mentioned it briefly last time. When we've reached a certain level, a certain stage in uh, in our spiritual, on the spiritual path, that the clear light mind, the clear light mind of death can manifest in a, con manifest in a controlled fashion. It realizes emptiness directly. And then that, that mind, that mind together with its subtle winds, well, the 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 subtle clear light mind, as I said, directly realizes emptiness. And at some point, the subtle energy winds that are inseparable from this very subtle clear light mind, they manifest in the form of an illusory, illusory body, illusory body. So that is in the nature of the mind, in that the very subtle energy wind is the substantial cause is that which arises as the illusory body. And since the subtle energy wind is of the same nature as the subtle clear light mind, it's of the nature of that subtle clear light mind. That's why we say the illusory body is of the nature of the mind, subtle clear light mind. So this is a manifestation of the mind and an example of a body appearing or being manifested, being emanated by the mind, which is very different to our mind connecting to something that's already there. That's that's the yeah, like the fertilized egg, as I said earlier on. It doesn't come from the subtle energy winds. Um, when we perceive our guru goes on, does our mind take on the aspect of our guru? Well, the physical aspect, 
Yes, the physical form, it takes on the aspect, whatever appears to our mind. Um, if we have the karma to perceive the guru, depending on, I think of guru can mean so many different things, but a fully qualified guru, a guru who's reached, like, like let's say, the path of seeing, for instance, having a, a different type of body path of meditation a different kind of body an emanated body we have the karma to perceive um perceive such a body then yeah our mind takes on the aspect of whatever appears to the mind i mean whatever physical aspect um appears to the mind so it takes on the aspect of that physical um body it, it appears to the mind and so forth and when the people perceived Shakyamuni Buddha did they do it through their mind taking on the aspect of Shakyamuni Buddha yeah so Buddha Shakyamuni it's of course uh there's a difference between seeing an ordinary person and seeing an Arya Bodhisattva and even greater someone like a Buddha like Buddha Shakyamuni and again there are also differences in terms of a Buddha there are different emanations as I talked about it during this, these the last the, the classes we've gone through, um, it came up on a few occasions. Well, you have different emanations. You have those emanations that are in the nature. They are called sambhogakaya. So we cannot perceive them as ordinary beings. Only Arya Bodhisattvas can perceive them. Now, although they're right, they may be right in front of us. They may be well. Actually, they said to abide in in certain pure lands, akanishta, uh, as they're called. But anyway, um, even if they were right in front of us, we couldn't see them. Um, but of course, there are other uh, emanations, such as the emanation of Buddha Shakyamuni, who was the supreme Nirmanakaya. Well, for those who have a pure karma, as it's described, so a certain pure karma whatever does that what does that mean pure karma pure in terms of what but that's usually not really described it's just in the scripture it says who has pure karma so enough merit uh, not too many obstructions those people if they were around at the time they could perceive buddha shakyamuni and if they perceive buddha shakyamuni of course their mind took on an aspect of well, the body, of course, Buddha Shakyamuni. When we say perceive, I mean, this is true for any person other than ourselves. We don't perceive their mind unless we have uh, some higher perceptions, some clairvoyance. But for us ordinary people, we say, I see, I don't know, Dalit, I see Leora, I see Gila, and so forth. Well, I, I'm really just seeing her body. So I label, I see Gila, for instance, when I see her body. I see John when I see his body um so i label seeing that that's the label i apply and that's correct because in terms of john being labeled on his mind and body if i perceive his body i can correctly say i see john um however really what i see what is the basis of imputation here for labeling i see john base of imputation is his body which if a part of the body appears to me. And when someone perceives Buddha Shakyamuni, of course there were other beings who didn't perceive, who, who thought Buddha Shakyamuni was just an ordinary guy and maybe thought he was a, a thug or whatever. I mean, there were definitely beings who were not able to perceive. So they didn't perceive the Buddha. They perceived something, but it it didn't, it didn't really, it didn't represent the Buddha. So they had a completely wrong perception. So in that case, they didn't perceive Buddha Shakyamuni and their mind did not take on the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. But for those who had the pure karma to perceive Buddha Shakyamuni, um, the, the appearance in the form of a Buddha, well, in that case, the answer is yes. When they perceived it, perceived the Buddha, of the, the body of the Buddha, they took on the aspect, their mind took on the aspect of the Buddha, Buddha appeared. Okay. Then there is a question here to show one atom. Oh, this I think is relates to the mind of a bodhisattva who can emanate one atom. 
uh, one and the size of an atom as the universe and the universe manifest in the in the as the size of an atom um without the size of either of those uh changing which seems physically totally impossible and then he goes on to say i think this is tau city no i'm not sure it doesn't say whose oh, question no, it's is from edward ah it's from edward okay all right okay so our universe is fractal in nature is our mind in regarding this universe is fractal is our mind in regarding this universe fractal fractal that's really difficult um i don't have a good understanding of what fractal means well i kind of seem to seem to think it's like that it's made that which makes up the whole i mean that's something in mathematics right and it's like what makes the forms that make up the whole are also this the substances that make it i i don't know how to put this so whatever the whole is made of it, it has the same shape that the, the whole like the whole shape like if you have a triangle it's made of many different triangles so the it's its entire shape being a triangle it's made of also many many triangles so that's fractal that's somehow uh that's my understanding of it so let's say okay in other words the universe is made of the same substances or the same shape it's made up this so the parts of the universe have the same shape as the universe itself okay let's say i've understood that correctly the term fractal so is our mind in regarding this universe fractal no but it doesn't have a shape where although it can perceive the universe but it doesn't have a shape and then it says we w-h-e-y we way way or is it why is it clear or not to the mind sorry i don't understand that question why it is clear or not to the mind yeah sorry if edward is there he could maybe uh let me know what is meant with that question is he there no all right sorry can't go through it and again the question what is the actual difference between uh aspect and mental image oh difference between number mental aspect mental oh yeah and again appearance okay i think i explained this before oh maybe one thing i talked about appearance actually just from the point of view of a sense consciousness then of course it's a lot more complicated when it comes to conceptual minds uh when it when it comes to a conceptual mind it's slightly different i wasn't even uh considering that when i first answered this question so it becomes more complicated in that uh we talk about uh, a conceptual mind has a conceptual appearance as venerable Tupton children calls it she doesn't call it the meaning generality or general image she refers to it as the conceptual appearance which i think is a very good uh, term so, and the conceptual mind has a conceptual appearance that is representative of the object that it takes to mind, that is its principal object. But although we say it's an appearance of the object, but it's just a generic kind of aspect. It's just what it means to this person. What does a table mean to a particular person? when the table is not in front of them when they're just thinking about it as an example when they just remember the table um so there's like an aspect of the table in the form of a conceptual appearance that appears to the mind so we can say that a table appears but it appears in the form of this conceptual appearance uh, and that is again that's a little different so does it take on the aspect of the table well but only through this generic aspect of the table right so it takes on the aspect 
number shower. So you would still use the same word. You would still talk about taking on the aspect. In fact, in Tibetan, you say the aspect arises to the mind. It's, it's, it's not so much about saying taking on the aspect. That's the English translation. It's more about the aspect arising to the mind. And both words are still again used interchangeably. It appears to the mind. The aspect arises to the mind. And even though in, in the case of a conceptual consciousness, the appearance of the object is considered to be the conceptual appearance and not the object itself, versus uh, in the case of uh, an, a direct perceiver, it's the object itself. It's like it's appearing in the form of all its changes. It's constantly changing. So if you have a, ta a table to an eye consciousness, when the table appears, that appearance is constantly changing because the table is changing. The mind is not aware of that. But still, these changes appear versus the conceptual mind. The conceptual appearance is the generic representation of the object in that what it means to that mind, what a table is, and that's permanent. That appearance doesn't change moment by moment. It's really complicated, and I, I apologize for confusing you, but anyway, the question relates to Lorik, and the answer is a Lorik or an answer with regard to the study of mind, which is also described as the study of Lorik. Okay. So, and then there are more questions. They were sent in by Jimmy for the last day. Quite a few questions. So I'll go through them one by one. In a previous session, I'll read through this now because I, I don't want to miss out anything. So in a previous session, I attempted to demonstrate physicality, materiality, by waving Geshe Lai, she calls me, calls me so by waving, waving her arms around and claiming that they're obstructed by material objects. But this is not what I meant. And I think the above term demonstration was not a valid proof. Why? Because we're talking about tactile sensations here. I don't know if you remember that session. I don't remember exactly when that was. Um, so anyway, it was he was he, uh, he was talking about tactile sensations or we were talking about tactile sensation sensations of hardness softness heat cold etc which are not happening in space they're not obstructing space okay they're, they're and they're not obstructed by anything hmm. okay so what i meant even though i don't really remember i but i can imagine like hardness how do i perceive hardness well by moving by by touching the object so right now if I move my hand through space and I'm doing it again I'm waving my hands um or my hand so as I'm moving my hand there's nothing obstructing it but if there's a, a hard object coming my way so I experience hardness and that's what we call hardness or if it's I don't know a, a cotton pad I experience softness if I touch a hot object, heat, if I touch a piece of ice, then it's cold and hard. So I have both tactile sensations. So for me, I can only talk about these sensations through my experience. I guess that's why I um, try to demonstrate. I try to demonstrate it in that way. Of course, he's right. Well, I would still say happening in space. I mean, sense objects that have tactility that have hardness and softness they do have an existence in space and they're obstructing space they're obstructing um they're obstructing where they are right now in that in the space in front of me there is no other object there's nothing in, in the well, nothing in the nothing big enough. So let's use the example of a pencil. There's no pencil in the space in front of me, or an ice cream, a hard and cold ice cream. No, it's not there because I can use my I can move my hand through it. Versus if there were an ice cream now, 
in exactly this spot, I couldn't move my hand in that unobstructed way. So I would argue, and the, the text would argue as well, the Buddhist texts, they argue that such an object obstructs space. Okay. But of course, we experience sensations. Now, the sensations are not the object. But the sensations can happen because there is the object. Okay, on a conventional level, there is the object. Uh, I know where Jimmy is going. I've already answer, uh, read the question, of course, but also because I know his main argument is mind only. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'm arguing from the point of view that they are external objects. From the point of view of the Prasangika school, saying that conventionally there are. Um, of external objects and i'll come to this but yeah that's why he's his argument here is that there, there are no uh external objects so sensations continue on irrespective of whether we bump into something or not that is true i only gave the example i was not saying that in order to have a tactile sensation you need to move your hand around in space i mean there are plenty of uh, tactile sensations in the body you know when you eat food etc there's a tactile sensation being full it's the feeling of fullness that is a tactile sensation without me moving my hand around i mean that was really just an example so sensation continue on is irrespective of whether we bump into something or not i agree of course it is very ob obvious and experimental but provable isn't it yes of course and again that was actually just meant as an example, my waving around my hand. Therefore, this demonstration cannot support substantially substantiality, mass, or materiality. Can't we say that substantiality, mass, or materiality are just some baseless ideas that people hold, hold on to because they learned it at school and they're too lazy to investigate? Here we go. It goes back to mine only as far as I understand this. Some baseless ideas. Okay. Mm. I wouldn't say that our sensations are baseless. I would say on the basis of our sensations, we have that sense. And I think the investigation that people do to some degree actually go through seems to support that there are physical objects. But we get to that. Instead, they keep discussing their beliefs with other people every day. So it seems as if there was such thing, such thing because everyone is talking about it, right or not. Well, I believe people are talking about it because there are these sensations. Couldn't we perfectly describe everyday experience, for example, people, lands, machines, computers, etc., with without bringing in the concept of materiality at all? Why can't we say that all the above are just collective visualizations? It would explain everything perfectly. Hmm. For you, maybe. For you, probably. But not for everyone. Not for everyone. I, I don't think collectively i mean i think people would not agree that we're just visualizing this uh they would say no it's they just see i can move my hand in this case and i can't move in this other case and i have the experience of cold and heat etc um this is again the same situation we had this discussion before um the way you put it forth is very much mind only now of course in the end um I don't think my arguments will suffice to say, well, mine only is incorrect. I mean, I try and argue as much uh, as much as I can. I mean, the, the arguments I, I did learn. So, well, let me just continue actually first. And of course, there cannot be the smallest substantial indivisible particles, atoms, because everything is indif in, indefinitely divisible, infinitely di divis divisible, divis yeah, divisible. Therefore, there are no atoms either. Okay, so there are no atoms because they're infinitely divisible. Hmm. I would say there's also no visualization because that's infinitely divisible. The argument goes there's nothing because everything is in, 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 infinitely divisible. So if you say there are no atoms because it's infinitely because they're infinitely divisible, then there's nothing else because everything is infinitely divisible. Okay. Anyway, that's just one small argument. But atom means indivisible. Okay, so that's the 
meaning of the word, but I mean, also the mind in terms of time can be, um, although it's not, it's indivisible in a different way. It's not called atom, but the mind can also be divided up in, in moments in time. And again, infinitely. Why can't we say that everything is just mentally created, visualized? What's wrong with that? Is it because we're living in the age of the dark religion of materialism? Why can't we accept mentalism instead and get rid of materialism altogether? Okay. Yeah, like I said, it's the old um, the, the, the argument we previously had, the discussion we previously had. Well, from a Buddhist point of view, and I'm saying Prasangika Madhyamika school point of view, the Buddha himself was very clear in that he said, in terms of inherent existence and the, the 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 wrong perception of permanence that arises from our wrong perception of inherent existence, well, that's different. The Buddha denied definitely inherent existence, perceiving phenomena to be permanent, whereas that while well, they're not. So the certain wrong views, the Buddha definitely contradicted, but he's very clear. He said, on anything else, I do not contradict the world. Therefore, there's no inherent material object. There's no inherent, um, yeah, like no, 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 no permanent material object. No inherent, no, no existing material object that exists in and of itself, etc. That for us ordinary beings seems to be so concrete and in and of itself as something being something substantial. Uh, being something material that doesn't exist but conventionally conventionally we can talk about an object having a certain temperature okay so we talk about a hot object based on our sensations it's labeled it's labeled a hot object all right so fire for instance conventionally there is fire because there's the perception of our eye consciousness of a color in a certain shape and color. There's the tactile perception, there's sounds that this object makes. And based on that, we label fire. And since we perceive this as external to our own mind, we label external fire. And there is no contradiction. Since it's consistent, we're not talking about it of something else from one day to another here labeling is there's a certain basis of designation and consistently we label on that basis we label it as fire we don't call it ice cream one day and the next day fire no we call it fire so we can say concept con conventionally it is fire of course in the end it's our sensations it's our perception of this object that allows us to say in the first place that it's there. So the mind plays the major role in this case. It's really the perceptions, it's, it's the sensations that arise to our mind that allow us to perceive the basis of designation and then based on that, the actual object. Okay, now, therefore, it's of course the sensations, it's of course that mind is the major it's, it's the main object but still as i said the buddha does not contradict the world there is no problem there is no contradiction in terms of how we perceive things i mean we were born and if we hadn't studied philosophy if we hadn't studied anything else um well just that aspect of perceiving something external of our own of our own mind um that doesn't that that is supported that that can be supported by what the buddha taught there's no contradiction except for the inherent existent part but other than that in, in what way does it contradict i mean what is the argument well, how can i put it the world would rather think that they're external objects than everything being a visualization and since inherent existence which is uh, which is um, refuted by the buddha that that on the basis of the lack of inherent existence external existence still perfectly works why not accept it you see 
like I said, the Buddha very clearly expressed on many occasions, I do not contradict the world. So, of course, in terms of inherent existence, yes. But once that's out of the way, lack of inherent existence, it is. Okay, on that basis, phenomena exist conventionally as external, as fire and so forth, without denying the fact that it's merely labeled on the basis of the sensations we have. Well, based on those sensations, we say conventionally there's fire. And since it's 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 conventionally not just an appearance to the mind. Uh, it's an appear well, not just an appearance to the mind in that it's not like we're just dreaming and we wake up from the dream and there's no fire in the room, but instead we have this appearance due to certain causes and conditions, and other people have a similar experience and we can communicate communicate it. On that basis, we say there's conventional fire. So that's my answer to that. There's conventional uh, materialism. There is conventional substantiality, which is different to conventional non-substantiality, such as mind. Conventionally, it is perceived differently. Therefore, we label it differently and therefore it exists different. That's, that's my answer to the first question, which is why I believe Conventionally, there is external phenomena. Conventionally, we can label fire. We can label fire existing external to ourselves, ice cream, etc. And these are all conventionally external phenomena. But that does not contradict the fact that they are labeled on the basis of sensations, of course, happening to the mind or appearing to the mind or being perceived by the mind. All right, that's the first question. And again, what's the actual difference between number, that is aspect, and appearance? Okay, this, this was mentioned so many times. I hope I've, uh, I've answered it now. If not, if it's not answered to your satisfaction, please answer. ask again if you are still part of the next uh, course we'll have. We can still, can still be addressed. So for now, I, hope, I, I think I, I'll leave it at that. Then it goes on, number three, the third question he asks. It's entitled, Similar Shared Experiences. We say that human beings share similar experiences. But since it is not possible to compare subjective personal experiences, how can we say that they're similar at all? We already touched on this issue a long time ago, but maybe possible to elaborate a bit more. Yeah, very important. In fact, all the other questions I also thought were very important. This first question is very important. Really, I mean, even though I don't agree, but I still think it's a very important question. Um, the second also, I've already answered it. And now the third is shared experiences. So true. Very, very true. Um, the Buddhist response, there's like a, a kind of a, a vocabulary that is used or certain terminology that is used also in the mind only school this is a terminology this is a terminology that's used a lot in the mind only school but the terminology can also be applied to the present giga madhyamika school the terminology is when not analyzing when not analyzing we talk about a common experience when analyzing we talk about a unique experience. What does that mean, analyzing? Well, exactly as he's done here, a common experience. We kind of say, oh, I look at an object and I say, oh, look, it's blue. And another person says, oh, yeah, it's blue. And I say, oh, it looks really pretty. And the other person says, oh, yeah, it's really pretty. Based on that, we say there's a common experience. I call it blue. The other person calls it blue. I say it's pretty. The other person says it's pretty. And then I say, oh, it's actually a blue table. And the other person agrees, oh, yeah, it's a blue table. So without analyzing, we're all agreeing it's blue, it's a table, and it looks really pretty. Okay, so based on that, we say we have a common experience. But when we analyze, what does the other person really see, right? Is the blue that appears to my, the, 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 the hue, the color that appears to my mind, it is the, the 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 blue is does it appear in a totally different shade, a different hue, a different color? Maybe the person's blue is my green, and my green is their blue. I mean, there are ex examples of that. I don't know whether you you've ever heard of the BBC dress. 
the dress that was that was introduced by the BBC. You could just Google it. Just Google the BBC dress. It's pretty easy. It's a dress a woman showed to her mother she wanted to wear on her wedding. It's not a wedding dress, it's an evening gown. Oh no, the, the, uh, the mother wanted to wear it during the, the wedding of the daughter. And she sent her a picture and they both disagreed on the shade. One said it was white with gold and the other one said it was blue with black, right? And so this became a huge topic of discussion where it's like some people perceive it this way and others that way. And I've showed it to different students, to one of my teachers, and it was really interesting. We were all sitting together and it was half of the group thought it was white gold and the other half thought it was blue black. Okay, um, it's really interesting. Anyway, um, so the point is that we actually can perceive colors differently. And of course, there's always a disagreement on blue and green. Is it turquoise? My mom and I have that, like lilac and blue. What she what I perceive as lilac, she thinks it's always blue. And I'm like, but there's lilac and that's lilac. And she's like, no, it's blue. Anyway, so there is this, this, um, this difference. However, in the example that I've given, if we both agree it's blue, um, it's, we both agree it's blue, we both um, agree it's a table, we both agree it's beautiful, we say we have a common experience. But that is without analyzing. As I said, if we analyze the color that appears may be different, the shape that is typical to a table may appear very differently. And beautiful or not, why do I consider it beautiful? It may be because of its clear lines. And the other person may consider it beautiful because of its uh, the material it's made of, right? So we agree on being beautiful, etc. But first of all, that appears differently. And the reason for calling it beautiful are different. So in the end, it's totally unique. Therefore, yes. When we talk about shared experiences, that is on that in that in that way where we say again conventional. It's 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 really the conventional level. It goes to the it's more part of the conventional level. Well, we we both call it beautiful, right? We both call it table. That's no, I mean convention. Uh, beauty beauty is more subjective actually than table itself right? There's a lot more disagreement that it's a table as humans from a certain cultural, with a certain cultural background, we would all agree it's a table. With animals, of course, it's again, totally different besides the fact we can't communicate with them. But let's just stick to humans as part of a certain uh, culture. We would all agree it's a table, okay? So that's the common experience. But of course, what we perceive may be very different. Okay, therefore, conventionally, without analyzing, we can say, yes, there's a table. We have a common experience of a table. The moment we start analyzing, and I'm not even talking about going into the ultimate, such as what is the table in the table, but going in that direction of analyzing, what do I perceive? What do you perceive? You perceive something totally different. Like I said last time, we sit, we stand in a, we're in a different place. I have a different perspective than you do. Therefore, the part of the table that you perceive is not the same part. We perceive something different. Where's the common experience? And I answered that. It's just the fact that we would both agree it's a table. Um, when it's cold, my experience of the cold, your experience of, the, of, of cold is definitely, it's unique, it's different. The degree of cold may be different. We would both agree it's cold. For one, it would be pleasant. For the other, other one, for the, for the other person, unpleasant. But just the fact that we agree it's cold, that's why we say it's a common experience. All right? So it's, again, as long as we don't analyze, that is the meaning of conventional. Jimmy's question his previous question, well, is there really something solid and mass? No, without going into the ultimate analysis, like how is a mass a mass in itself and so forth, even without going into that, just taking modern physics, atoms are made 90%, what is it, 90% of space of like 
non-tangibility of space. So if that's the case, you have an object in front of you that's 90% actually made of space. Why does it seem so solid? Yeah, that's already going into, into a level. Like I said, it's not really ultimate analysis, but you're analyzing. You're analyzing and things start disappearing. That solidity starts to disappear. But just without analyzing, our common day-to-day -day experience is that of a hard object. So we call it a hard object in space, obstructing, etc. without analysis, right? Therefore, conventional is, or is often described as the non-analyzed state, the state that is not analyzed, all right? Not analyzed in that way, like looking deeper at the object, okay? Whereas the moment you start analyzing things, things start disappearing. And the mind itself starts disappearing. So in Jimmy's, with regard to Jimmy's argument, I totally get where he's coming from. It makes perfect sense to me. And I think it's great, his way of thinking. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I, I can't agree uh, with this. And I would say if you start to, if you, if you Jimmy, I'm addressing you uh, directly, if Jimmy, if you start analyzing the mind, you know, under undertake the same analysis of the mind that you undertook when it comes to material objects, the mind starts to disappear. So in the end, you have no longer a mind. There's no object. There's no mind. Which moment of mind is the mind? Uh, which moment? And so, if, I mean, if you just analyze moments, of course, it's much harder to do than an object we can perceive without sense consciousnesses. But with any analysis of any object, the object starts to disappear. And that's why phenomena don't exist inherently. When things start to disappear, then we're looking for something concrete, something inherent. And since that doesn't exist, we don't find anything ever. But conventionally, without this analysis, and here we're not saying flying cows exist or certain bizarre things exist. There's a certain degree of analysis that helps us to understand what exists conventionally and what does not. But then there's a, a certain analysis, a different type of analysis, that when we engage in that, all that starts to disappear. And, and with this kind of analysis, we're moving towards the ultimate. Therefore, shared experiences, to summarize this third question, shared experiences are the experiences we agree on without really analyzing, all right? And I'm not talking about these just one more thing. I'm not saying I see a chair and you see a table and we both say it's a table, but actually one is wrong. No, no. On a kind of worldly basis, without going into too much detail, we agreed on what is a table and based on that common definition, when we see a particular object and we agree it's a table then conventionally without um, analyzing our subjective experience of that and so forth, we both agree it's a table. So we have a common experience on that conventional level. All right. Sorry. That was a really long answer. I hope I didn't uh, confuse anyone by that long answer. Then number four, the, what is it? The five disadvantages of samsara. Buddhism talks about the six disadvantages, no, no, I said five, no, the six disadvantages of samsara. Buddhism talks about the six disadvantages of samsara. Hmm. For example, that the lifespan is uncertain and companions are uncertain. Yes, that's from the Lamrim as far as I remember, but I don't have the whole list. Ah, and I was supposed to list them. I forgot to look them up. Would it be the case that nirvana is the opposite and the opposite of these apply to nirvana? For instance, certainty of lifespan, companions, etc. Does anyone have spontaneously that list? Uh, I would have to look it up in the Lamrim. Six disadvantages of samsara. Uh, lifespan is uncertain. Okay, that's probably... The Four Noble Truth. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jimmy. I, I read through it quickly, but I forgot to look it up. I should have looked it up. So I'll try and do this some other time. 
okay unless someone can do it right now uh, maybe just google six go to the lamb chemon well it takes forever if you've got just six six disadvantages would help i don't want to do it as i'm talking to you because that would be really disruptive um, not Google, sorry. I mean, just go into the text and then use the search function. Maybe you'll find it. Anyway, um, so does that not apply to samsara? Is the lifespan certain? Well, yeah, we're not reborn under the control of karma and afflictions. For instance, if you are a bodhisattva, an Arya bodhisattva, or even a Buddha, being able to manifest I mean, even an arhat, an arhat is no longer reborn. So someone who has attained self-liberation, well, eventually they will enter the Mahayana path and will eventually uh, strive towards Buddhahood or aspire towards Buddhahood and take on a mental body. Uh, but even in that state of having a mental body, well, it's there's no uncertainty because it's in a controlled fashion. So an emanation um of a buddha a bodhisattva again there's no uncertainty because it's totally controlled uncertainty implies um that there's no control that anything could happen any time but once we control our mind we con can control at least the physical aspects concerning ourselves which emanations we emanate and so forth of course there's still the karma of other sentient beings, how effective they can be, etc. That is dependent, of course, on the karma of the person to be taught, the student, etc., the disciples, etc. However, there's no uncertainty for the person emanating uh, them. And companions are not uncertain in that a Bodhisattva knows that Ka or a Buddha in particular. So the certainty, uncertainty is totally gone within total knowledge of what to expect uncertainty also has the connotation of not knowing what's to happen but a buddha knows the person's karma knows um when they're going to die when they have the karma to die and so forth no knows what a buddha can do to intervene possibly oh the sick suffering there's something there let me just check um something in French oh there's Raphael uh, thank you Raphael she said the suffering of uncertainty the suffering of dissatisfaction the pain of having to leave your body the suffering of being reborn the suffering of ups and down the suffering of loneliness okay that that sounds pretty I'll, I'll say it slowly um, for Jimmy so Raphael very kindly posted this in the chat the suffering of uncertainty the suffering of dissatisfaction the pain of having to leave your body again and again, the suffering of being reborn in suffering again and again, the suffering of ups and downs, nothing stable in samsara, and the suffering of loneliness. Okay. Now, with regard, okay, so the companions are not mentioned, but it's part of the suffering of ups and down. Nothing is stable in samsara. Okay, so the first is just the uncertainty. Okay, it doesn't mention the lifespan, but never mind. So uncertainty, everything we experience, it's uncertain. The future is uncertain. We have no idea. We just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The suffering of dissatisfaction. Okay, so uncertainty does not happen for a Buddha. That's where there's no uncertainty because knowing the, the three times. Um and then the suffering of dissatisfaction. No, the greatest state of bliss is experienced by a Buddha. Um, the pain of having to leave your body again and again. No, it's totally controlled. There's no like having to leave anything behind. The suffering of being reborn and suffering again and again. There's no suffering. Nothing to be reborn uh, in. I mean, no suffering to be reborn in. The suffering of ups and downs and again no these are ups and downs are like well yeah for us it's like i feel good and then i feel the horrible and then i feel good again and then I feel up. so this constant change and ups and downs well my own moods for instance or the situation around me but again for a buddha they're just mere appearances to the mind they don't believe a buddha doesn't believe in the and this inherent up and down, etc. When it comes to the external, 
like conflicts in the world and then peace again and so forth um and in terms of their own the, the the personal state of mind of the buddha again there are no ups and downs as such so it's total stability everything is experienced as blissful i mean not to say that suffering is not suffering but not for a buddha the suffering of loneliness oh no loneliness there because uh oh there's also the eight types of suffering well i guess because he's only asked for the six i think that should suffice but yes for jimmy also you can look up uh, the eight types of suffering of samsara. So here are just the six mentioned. The suffering of loneliness. Um, yeah, that's a big issue nowadays. We feel, oh, okay, there she's just posted it. Thank you. Um, she just posted the eight. But anyway, um, so the suffering of loneliness. Um, big issue nowadays. We feel totally isolated from everyone else. But in our Buddha knows we're all connected. We're all connected. And when we have real love and compassion for other sentient beings, we don't feel lonely. We don't care. They don't like us. We love them unconditionally. And so wherever we are, the other sentient beings feeling they're so attractive, they're so wonderful in that they have the potential to become Buddhas. And all their flaws, all their shortcomings, they're merely temporary. They're not in the nature of their mind. So for a Buddha, Walking into, I don't know, a crowd of people, or even if they're alone in, in, in this in a certain place, doesn't matter. Thinking of sentient beings, there's no loneliness. There's this connection with all sentient beings and understanding of their incredible potential, incredible love and compassion. So how could a Buddha feel lonely? Right? Loneliness is a very, very painful emotion, very painful state of mind. Um, but it's not in accordance with reality. And the stronger our love and compassion and this feeling of closeness towards sentient beings. Remember, we talk about this affection in the beginning of setting the motivation, this feeling of closeness, just seeing sentient beings as attractive and, and not expecting to be loved and liked, etc. back. Loneliness comes from this feeling of wanting something back wanting to be accepted wanting to be this if there's no expectation but rather just the wish for sentient beings to be happy without these expectations and it's difficult to shut it off but if it's gone lonely there's no loneliness right okay anyway sorry i uh, just wanted to mention that anyway so those are the six and then Raphael, she also mentions the eight uh suffering of birth suffering of aging suffering of illness suffering of death all that is gone for a buddha right birth is a controlled out of love and compassion so blissful everything is blissful birth aging illness death it's all blissful for a buddha manifesting those the suffering being confronted with what we dislike doesn't happen for a buddha the suffering of being separated from what we like number six doesn't happen for a buddha Number seven, the suffering of not getting what we want. And number eight, the suffering of contaminated aggregates of the body. No, none of those are not an issue. There's no suffering. So none of these sufferings arise. It's all blissful. The Buddha gets whatever the Buddha wants that is working for the benefit of sentient beings. Um, yeah. Anyway, so in short, I hope this answers your fourth question. And then the last question is memory in the Buddhist context. Since we can only experience present objects, how can we define memory, the remembering of past events? What is the explanation of memory in the lower and higher tenets? Consciousness taking a past object seems impossible. Wouldn't a subsequent cognizer be the Buddhist term for memory? I think even lower tenets reject subsequent cognizers as not a valid way of knowing, and prasangikas don't deal with them at all. Well, first of all, to get to the last part of your question, lower tenets reject subsequent cognizers. Well, they they say that they are not prasang, pras, uh, no, what is it? Uh, pramana. The Tibetan word, no, the Sanskrit word for valid cognition is pramana. Actually, in the lower schools, pramana or tsema in Tibetan is means a prime cognizer it means not a valid cognizer but rather 
a prime cognizer, a mind that newly knows its object. Therefore, a subsequent cognizer is not a prime cognizer, obviously. A mind that subsequently cognizes its object does not newly know its object, but it knows its object. So it is valid in the lower schools, pramana or tsema would not be translated into English in, in English as valid cognizer, but as prime cognizer. So the lower schools would say a subsequent cognizer is valid, it knows its object, but not newly. Therefore, it's not pramana. It's not uh it's not, yeah, pramana, it's not sema. In the higher schools, um, well, in the highest in the Prasangika school, the word pramana, the word um the word pramana or the word uh, uh tsema is translated as valid cognizer. Now, in some of my handouts, when I talk about the different schools, I use valid cognizer all the time because it's confusing. You keep changing the terminology in English, but in Tibetan, it's the same word. So sometimes I just choose the word valid cognizer, but explain that in the lower schools, a subsequent cognizer is valid. It is a cognizer, but it's not a valid cognizer because it doesn't newly know its object. So I have to give this explanation. Um, but other than that, in answer to what Jimmy says here, what would you say here, Jimmy? Subsequent cognizers are accepted, but they're not prime cognizers. In the Prasangika school, there are subsequent cognizers, but they're also valid cognizers because a valid cognizer is a mind that is incontrovertible with regard to its principal object, okay? That is incon that is not wrong when it comes to its principal object and that knows the appearance. It realizes the appearance to that mind. And so subsequent cognizers are also valid cognizers. Subsequent cognizers are explained, absolutely. I mean, in the Madhyamika, um, in the commentaries, they're definitely mentioned. Subsequent cognizers are mentioned. Um, in fact, I just uh, worked through uh, the, the new book by, oh, never mind, it's, it's not important. Uh, anyway, so to just, yeah, to, to be precise, so subsequent cognizers, subsequent cognizers are accepted at the present Giga school. They are mentioned as part of the study of Madhyamika. For instance, when we study uh, Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary on entry into the middle way. We study it. We have a commentary that is used in Drepung Losa Ling and in Ganden Chatse, these two uh, colleges. We study, we use these books by these texts by Benji Tsongkhapa. As I said, these texts are used to like the debate manuals or the main texts in Drepung Losa Ling in Gandhi Chatze and also um, at the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics and other nunneries, of course, and some nunneries. Anyway, in there, there's a whole section on, on this. I mean, there's a whole explanation on valid cognizer, what they mean. Um, and in that context, as far as I remember, subsequent cognizers are mentioned. And uh, yeah, so therefore subsequent cognizers and valid cognizers are not contradictory and they're definitely mentioned. But to go back to your question, well, memory, how does it work? Well, you're right, it's subsequent cognizer. A memory is always considered to be a subsequent cognizer. Um, and so it's a conceptual mind. And what happens is, Due to the, the direct perception of an object, let's say I've seen a table, right, this morning, and now I remember, I remember the table. It appears to my mind, I have a conceptual appearance, as Venerable Tripton Chodron would call it, I have a conceptual appearance, um, conceptual appearance, or I have the generic image of the table appear, so it's a conceptual mind, and it arises through the force of having directly perceived it this morning. So that's why it's considered a memory. Now, why can that appear? Why can it appear? Well, my guess would be 
latencies were left on the mind, imprints, latencies were left on the mind, having seen this object in the morning, and these latencies ripen in the form of a memory. Uh, but anyway, that's how I see it, the, the kind of, the, the, the how that's how I would explain the possibility of a memory. So in both the lower and the high schools, they would say that this is a subsequent cognizer if the object is known, if you know table in that moment, you, you realize you know table, that is the subsequent cognizer because it arises um, through the power of a previous cognition of table. Yeah, so in answer to your question, therefore, that's how memory works. I hope I've answered all your questions now. Okay, time is up. And all that's left before we dedicate is to say a little bit about what's to come. Um, the next course, I, today I wrote um, a little summary of it. I've sent it to Gila so for the announcement. Just to, yeah, so like I wrote like a little announcement um, of what's to come. And as you all know, um, I would like to study with you and I'm not even saying I'll teach this. I'm, I'm studying with you this text, Nagarjuna's Fundamental Wisdom. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I don't feel qualified to teach this. Um, so even though if it's announced in that way, um, I would call it, well, I'm, I'm actually really just studying with you guys. So just going through it. And as I always say, you should really find someone who's qualified to teach it. But we can just maybe create the basic, I mean, go through, get, get some basic understanding of the text. And the format will be similar as the format of this class. Instead, except that we will meet on Mondays. Sundays are a little difficult for me, so Mondays are better. The time will be the same, except when I return to India, we'll have to change the time. Uh, and that, that'll be too late for me. Um, it, it's quite, and especially when the winter, I mean, now it's uh, summertime in Germany, but uh, winter, when well, in Israel, I should say, once it's winter time and I'm back in, in India, it'll be too late. But anyway, for now, that's uh, the time. It's going to be seven o'clock in Israeli time. And um, the format, like I said, is going to be the same we'll start with the short meditation i'm not sure you i'll go through all the prayers i have my mind i have made up my mind maybe just refuge and bodhicitta is fine and then start again for what you should focus on for the coming week and i thought to go through the lum room the different topics so to start with uh precious human rebirth say a few words about that something to you so yeah, it gives you the opportunity to meditate on the different topics of the Lum Room. So starting off with Precious Human Rebirth, say a few words about that, and then go right into the text. And we go through the different verses. Uh, the text will be made available to you. Um, I'm not sure which translations I use, but all the translations are widely available online. It's easy to find them. So I, I don't have a problem just posting them because the PDFs are available. My preference is for the translation by Jay Garfield. Um, there's also a commentary. It's it's there's the separate text is available as well as the text embedded in Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary on it, which is great. I'll definitely base um, base the explanations on Lama Tsongkhapa's commentaries because that's a commentaries well we we use when we study the text and it's very uh clear so it's ocean of reasoning that's the book it comes with like i said you find it online you may choose to buy it which i, I don't want to discourage you uh, from doing but it's also available online um in different uh yeah i found it in in different places actually i've got it myself um in that way i found it in that way widely available and so I want to go through these verses and something that I won't announce because I'm not sure I'll manage to do that but I'd like to use PowerPoint 
presentation, like PowerPoint in that, well, not just putting the main points as in like PowerPoint in that way, but also I've downloaded some apps that can be used on an iPad, so easily be done to make little diagrams, um, to just explain the verses in the form of these diagrams. Then, of course, they can be sent on as PDFs to be sent to all of you to be made available to you, or maybe can be downloaded somewhere. Um, it's just easier that you download them. But while we have class, um, I need to learn how to do this, but that wouldn't be that difficult to, sh to show the different diagrams on the screen and use the mouse as a pointer um, and explain in that way. I find that's a little easier to follow, have that visual input but I have to still have to work with this. I've already started familiarizing myself a little bit with at least one of those apps uh, to find how I can, you know, there's something called GoodNote 5. Um, so you can make easily diagrams with that. So I'm working on it and then hopefully find a way uh, where I can maybe split the screen one half is is uh, the 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 chart the diagram. One half is myself. Just that you or that you can choose whichever you want to see. Because for some people, just looking at the chart for an hour and a half or an hour, whatever, will be overwhelming. Uh, so you can at least choose, and I don't have to choose back and forth all the time or anyone else. Uh, so in that way, anyway, we'll figure it out. But that's the plan for now. So. Any that, what's new is really we're going through the lamb room as part as the uh, part of the preparatory. I mean, at the beginning, as part of the beginning part of the the lesson um, or the discussion. Then we'll have the text. We go through the verses as before, but hopefully I'll figure out these diagrams and so forth. I'll use them, and then we have a meditation as usual, and we dedicate, and that's it. Okay, so. As I said, the format is the same with a few alterations, a few changes. Okay, Dalit, was that okay? Is that enough? Fascinating. Yeah, this, this is very clear, and this is no problem mm -hmm. uh, because when you finish something, we always uh, put it on the website so people can take it down. And on the what? Wa wa sorry, on the WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. uh, I put it uh, to links that people can take it down and see it if it's not comfortable with, from the web. So no problem at all. And I know this uh, program, so it's easy to work with this. Great, great, wonderful. No problem. And Snee just ask, has a start date been set? Um, well, I think um, the person who's doing the announcement said she needs at least four weeks so from now on probably in four weeks time right so from today we will publish it in on the website and on the facebook and on the whatsapp so just keep on uh, if you have a problem you have here my email so you can email me and i will let you know so no problem at all Okay, great. So in about four weeks time, it's good for me also to have some time to prepare, to get ready. Uh, so it's good to have a break. And if you, yeah, check in three weeks time, Snee, then you'll know uh, what time will start. It should be decided by that time. Okay, great. Um, I hope I've answered all your question. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Gershwin. Oh, Varda. For, I really, really, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm not uh, presentable, <laughs> but I'm just, uh, it's so hot that I, I came from oh. outside, but never, I wanted to thank you very, very, very much. First of all, for me that you talk English, it's easier than Hebrew. Oh. <laughs> so, and all the, the way that you, um, go into answering questions, I think is one of the best uh, explanations I've heard about uh, different topics. And I really thank you very much for that. Sure, thank yeah. you. All right, great. Thank you for the feedback. Um, okay, so I guess we're done, right? We can actually now Close it, Varda. I never answered your question, but there's time next time, right? 
Um, so yeah, let's dedicate. Let's take a moment just to focus on having completed this particular course on entering the middle way by Chandakirti, having answered some questions, discussed some questions. So let's once again dedicate all the virtue we've accumulated during that time. Dedicate all that virtue for the benefit of all sentient beings towards our own awakening. So may this become a cause for us to quickly eliminate all our shortcomings, all our flaws, obstructions, defilements, and quickly attain the awakened state of a Buddha. May our merit also cause our lamas, in particular His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all the other great masters, to have an extremely, extremely long life. May they be healthy, be strong, to continue to teach us through their example and through their wise words. And may, of course, our virtue, the virtue we've accumulated, have an impact on this world right here, right now, and that may become a cause for all the conflicts, all the problems. In this world and in other worlds, may all those be reduced by the power of our merit. May people who are sick by Geshe Punso, Tali Lubin, and everyone else, whether physically sick or mentally sick, may they all soon recover, completely recover. And then let's continue to dedicate the way based on Shantideva's dedication prayer. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, attain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, well, Dalit, Leora, and everyone else who is part of the organization and taking care of things. And of course, everyone else for your participation, for your answers yeah that's for your questions and everything else all right
take care and maybe see you well in four weeks time. Thank you. Thank so you so much, Geshema. Thank you. It's amazing. Good Bye. night. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tamar friends. Bye. Thank you. Bye.